It is Friday, October 13th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another unknown episode of LTPS. It's been kind of a busy week in that there's not many news stories, but Sony's been doing a lot of talking, so uh, we'll be going over all that. But first, as always, a very brief reminder, grab your PS Plus Essential October games, they're live on PSN, and also the October PS Plus uh, Extra and Premium lineup is also announced as well, going live on October 17th, which uh, PS Plus Extra, we've got 11 games here, uh, that would be Gotham Knights, uh, Disco Elysium is, I would consider the headlining title on this one, you're going to definitely want to check that one out, it's uh, a fantastic game, and you've got some in here that are, I guess, more Halloween appropriate, you know, you've got the Dark Pictures Anthology House of Ashes, uh, Dead Island Definitive Collection, Alien Isolation, Outlast 2, so you've got a few things to explore. Um, and then for PlayStation Plus Premium, we have Tekken 6, Soul Calibur Broken Destiny, uh, both on PSP. We saw those games rated recently, so now they're uh, a part of this lineup. And then also Ape Escape Academy, the first one, PSP again. We already have the second one. And then also, very interesting, IQ Final for PlayStation 1, the only PS1 game this month. Uh, but it's something where that game never came out in North America, so that's the sequel to Intelligent Cube. And uh, again, fringe cases like that, I'm kind of, you know, I, I would add advocate for more of that, right? So uh, when it comes to Sony primarily focusing on their IP, although we do have some uh, third-party stuff this month, but uh, when we've got Sony heavily leaning on their IP and they're really rationing this stuff out, um, at least let's go for some of these more uh, either obscure titles or maybe games that were only released in uh, Japan or Europe, which we have a number of those titles, right? So it's cool to have that sort of availability in North America for the first time all these years later. Now, another PS Plus news, if you remember from the last PS5 beta firmware where they sent out additional separate invites for testing out PS5 game streaming and them saying they wanted to have this feature uh, completely rolled out by the end of this year, well, now they're confirming those release dates, which it is release dates because they are rolling this out by region. So uh, Japan would be first, coming October 17th, and then Europe October 23rd, and then North America on October 30th. Uh, as for the required internet speeds, uh, the minimum is going to be at least 5 to 15 megabits per second for 1080p, which is basically what you would need anyway for the existing PS3 and PS4 streaming. Uh, but for 4K, which would apply to PS5 titles, Sony says 38 megabits per second or more is the minimum. Uh, now, as for the overall catalog availability, we don't have a full list, but Sony is careful with their wording here where they say, and I quote, supported PS5 digital titles within the PlayStation Plus game catalog and game trials, as well as supported titles in the PS5 game library that PlayStation Plus premium members own. So that is what is expected to be available. Uh, they also say they're planning on having hundreds of PS5 titles supporting this new benefit. As for if that's day one or long term, I don't know, but ideally that would be uh, day one and they're going to be adding more and more as time goes on. But as for the uh, the streaming benefits and the features and what can be expected uh, in terms of, you know, what are you going to lose by streaming? Uh, it sounds like not much because nearly everything that downloaded titles normally have are still supported. So that includes the availability of DLC and add-ons, but also uh, all resolution options, 1080p, 1440, 4K, uh, up to 60 frames per second. So not you, you can't do a 120 hertz output, uh, but that should still also have SDR and HDR output. Uh, as for audio capabilities, that still includes 5.1 and 7.1, as well as Tempest 3D audio. And you can also still capture screenshots and record up to three minutes of video, so there is a cap on that. And uh, it is only for PS5 consoles initially, but we do expect that down the road it'll be for PC, maybe mobile, um, perhaps the PlayStation Portal, uh, if it can take on firmware updates and, you know, get that functionality, but, because uh, that still seems like such a strange omission, uh, but if not that, then maybe a Gen 2 version of that device seems like a, a natural step, and then uh, maybe also TVs, you only need a dual sense and you can start streaming PS5 games, you know, that's the thing with Sony is that they've always been really good at offering highly experimental, new, nascent technology 15 years early and because they do that it's often like not at all a very usable experience it feels like a novelty and there's no customer acquisition uh that that builds like a, a sustainable business right so they've done streaming to bravia tvs and samsung tvs uh with ps now but it all comes full circle maybe they'll they'll do it again um but i'll be honest i'm actually i'm genuinely excited 
and that's only because I just I want to see how much better it should be and that's the the huge caveat it should be a lot better this is something where the company has put a massive amount of you know R&D spend on what is the sort of next generation of streaming from the PlayStation business right so I know it's not it doesn't seem exciting with what is a, more of a core audience right streaming definitely does not have a you know, a good public image with uh, more of a core audience, or really just most people that stream video games, they find that it's, you know, you run into a lot of hiccups, input latency, you know, streaming artifacts, it's just, it's always been not a great experience. But, uh, you know, considering the amount of time and effort put into this uh, new initiative, which they don't, you know, they're not talking a whole lot about it, but you just know that it's been, it's, it's probably been a massive undertaking with the company. You know, they're launching way more data centers than they had before. Uh, also, their their fancy new PlayStation 5 server blades, it's new technology. You, you better hope that this stuff works tremendously better than what we're used to with PS3 and the, the PS4 streaming functionality. So, um, and the, the thing is, there is utility to it, right? It's not meant to be a replacement right now. There's always a conversation to be had about you know, what it's going to look like in 15, 20 years from now. Uh, but currently, it's very much additive, and there are use cases for it, which I would say easily would be game trials, right? Because that is something where, more often than not, if you want to use a game trial on PS Plus Premium, you're still downloading a full build of the game. And so in that case, right, where you're, you're downloading a large chunk of data um, just to try something out, and it's purely... Uh, a software lock on the, the trial portion of it. So that's why you're still downloading a full build of the game. It would be a lot more convenient to just, because this is under the guise of you wanting to try the game out, you know, instead of committing to 70 something gigabytes on your, um, on your storage. So again, to, to just sort of like jump in, give it a try, see if it hooks you. And then, okay, if you're going to make the purchase, then you're going to make that commitment to download it anyway, but, uh, to try it out that way, or, if there is something in your game library and you don't have the spare uh, the, the spare storage on your console or you just want to jump in to quickly check something or whatever the case may be, I mean, it, it's certainly very much a about a particular use case, but there are usable ways to make, you know, to make this more convenient for you. And then if you want to commit to a title, you would, of course, download it. So um, I just I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I want to try it out soon. And so we will certainly be there doing some coverage uh, as as soon as possible. Now, another PS Plus news item here is that uh, recently this was spotted on Reset Era, where a PS Plus Deluxe member noticed on the console that there was promotional imagery showing off The Last of Us Part 2, which The Last of Us Part 2 is not on PS Plus Extra or Premium or Deluxe right now, so that might imply that it will be a part of the game catalog very soon, or it could be a, a game trial, right? So uh, with that promo imagery we see, uh, Forbidden West, which is on the game catalog, but also uh, Hogwarts Legacy, which is a much more recent title, and that is on uh, that's on premium via a trial. So uh, you can't play the whole thing, obviously. But uh, The Last of Us Part Two, I would assume that's certainly going to be a game catalog title uh, for PS Plus Extra. Um, obviously, we have the the lineup for October already, so it's not a part of that lineup. But maybe it's something where we'll see it by November, December. Now, speaking of The Last of Us Part 2, good segue into our next news story, which is The Last of Us Part 2 on PS5. This was spotted by Angie and Siberia over on Reset Era, and uh, a lead outsource artist at Naughty Dog had mistakenly put on their LinkedIn that they worked on not only The Last of Us Part 1, but also The Last of Us Part 2 Remastered, which we would assume is for PS5 and probably PC as well, uh, which they immediately took this down once this was making the rounds. And uh, this would be so far our most concrete evidence of this project actually existing, because we have seen so far that back in early early 2022. Tom Henderson had briefly mentioned it. Uh, it was on Twitter. He didn't even make a story about it or anything like that. Just, you know, saying that he's heard that the game is coming. Uh, and then he wasn't so sure in recent months if it was uh, still on the way. But uh, we did also have back in June, I think it was, it was this year, which was the Last of Us composer, Gustavo. He had uh, mistakenly mentioned on a podcast during an interview that uh, for the new one, he said that you can walk up to him and request to play a song from him 
where his character is in Jackson playing the guitar, obviously. And so he was saying how in the new one, you can walk up to him and uh, request a song, which again, kind of implies that they're, you know, going to be shipping a native PS5 version and probably a PC version as well, which, um, I mean, that's that's ideally what this is, right? I mean, we obviously know that Sony is working on uh, around a two-year delta of the console versions coming out and then a PC release following after. It would be a bit strange to have a PC release and not do a native PS5 one. And so that's likely what Naughty Dog is doing. They're doing their PC stuff in-house, right, with The Last of Us Part 1. And so um, that's probably what's going on here. Uh, and, and that is a title that, out of some of the, the late life cycle PS4 stuff, it is surprising that we still have not had that one just yet. Uh, I just hope that they do enough meaningful things, right? Considering that like Tsushima was like basically just the PS4 game on PS5, really bare bones. Um, I'm not sure if they would give this the director's cut moniker. They've used remastered for when they did the first Last of Us on PS4, so they might want to do that again here. But, uh, you know, ideally just throw in some of those uh, high frame rate options and performance modes and, you know, if they are going to add a few little extra goodies like the Gustavo thing. But, uh, yeah, this is likely going to be a PS5 PC release, uh, which you got to figure it's going to be ready soon, but um, they'll talk about it when they are ready to, you know, show more. Moving on to our big news story from this past week, and it's Sony finally confirming the existence of the detachable disk drive PS5, the model that's been rumored for such a long time, and also the console that many would normally expect this to be the Slim model revision, the PS5 Slim, based on Sony doing this with nearly every PlayStation console, and so it's finally real. Uh, we already talked about it for our Tuesday upload, so we already covered most of this, uh, but we can say one additional fact is that, uh, and I don't think there was any doubt in this, uh, but IGN did receive a response from Sony where they did confirm you can still install a separate M.2 drive, so if you want to expand storage, you can still do that. Again, I don't think people were expecting Sony to get rid of that, but uh, you can still do that, which uh, it's also worth reaffirming. This console does have more onboard storage, one terabyte versus the rather unusual 825 we have right now, which has always amounted to a net usable storage of 667 gigabytes. So, you know, it's not a huge jump, but in theory, this one should be around 800. So you might be able to install two, three more AAA games, or maybe a lot of small games, depending on what you install. Uh, but now that we've had a few days to set on this, uh, I can say at least when it comes to the design of it, um, now look, I'm somebody that always liked the, the PlayStation 5 design. I actually, I, I think it looks great. I like it a lot, but, um, you know, it's, it's always, it's like the same song and dance with every like product reveal, not just PlayStation, although PS5 got a lot of, a lot of criticism in this department, but most like product reveals, there's always just a lot of like, I don't like it's left and right. Um, and, and so for this, I mean, it's, it's very much still the PS5 design language. And so, you know, by proxy, I do like it, but this thing does continue the trend of, for me personally, I have always preferred every gen one PlayStation, every single one of them. I don't know what it is. Um, Maybe it is more of a novelty thing of liking, you know, the first initial run of what is a new PlayStation console. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I prefer the the fatty, the big fatty, the largest fatty of them all at this point uh, throughout PlayStation history. And, um, but again, I, I don't think the Slim looks bad per se. I, I do uh, genuinely still think it looks pretty nice. Although obviously I prefer discs. And so that's what's <laughs> really off putting about the disc console this time around is that it's like they wanted this thing to be as small as possible for the sake of it. And so that like aggressive slope down from the disc drive where it seems like, again, they're just trying to save space for the sake of it. It looks very off-putting versus the existing model where it's much more of a, you know, a charismatic swoopy line that, you know, gives the console more of an iconic and not off-putting profile, if that makes sense. But, um, you know, if you're going for a digital edition console, then the new one, I think, looks very nice. It's a very sharp looking console. Um, now, in terms of the whole, is it a PS5 Slim or not thing, right? Well, 
Maybe so, considering we had uh, somebody on Reddit uh, made a 3D render of this. Um, this was the user Nature Certain. So it is a 3D render based on the information that Sony has provided. Since Sony you know, typically doesn't uh, put up comparison shots or videos, they don't normally do that. Sometimes they will, but they'll always speak in volumes and percentages and things like that. And so uh, anyway, this user did upload um, a 3D render showing what it might look like compared to the existing model, which uh, I think is going to be surprising to some folks, right? It does look uh, considerably smaller, more than I think some were thinking. Again, you, you got to keep in mind it's a, it's a 3D render. It might not really look that small per se, so it's really going to be down to when we have the thing on hand to do genuine comparisons. Uh, but I mean, yeah, it's still going to be a very large console, uh, just that if we're working with something where it's sized, if, it, if it's sized down by that much, uh, you know, even a little amount can make this thing you know, make it fit into entertainment centers that the existing one does not use. I've seen so many sort of haphazard PS5 setups where the thing has to go somewhere since it, it legitimately will not fit in some TV centers that people have. So based on that merit, it uh, it is still going to be a very large console probably, but I do find that it would likely still, I guess, earn that moniker of being called PS5 Slim. Still going to be big, but... If we're talking about the expected fan term, I'll always remind people that's, you know, Sony does not call these things slim, but if it is going to be close to that render, then I would say it, it earns that, that fan term. Um, although I do, I, I would prefer that we get a super slim eventually to see it go down even further than what we are going to get today. Next up, Sony talked about the PlayStation Access controller for PS5 recently, where over on the PlayStation blog, they discussed uh, the development of it, and they put out this long-form uh, promotional, not quite a trailer, but, you know, discussing the the sort of product design roadmap and how it was a five-year effort, uh, you know, going over multiple prototypes and working very closely with accessibility groups. And uh, they also showed off an image of the product box itself and how that is also very accessible with um, pull tabs to open the box. And then there's nothing in there that impedes on people from uh, being able to easily pull the access controller out and all the separate buttons. And so that was uh, cool to see, right? So really making sure that every part of the process is very much accessible. And uh, also alongside this post on the PS blog is the uh, embargo lift for what was a preview event of the accessibility controller. So um, Sony had a lot of people come out and try it. And so uh, previews are out there. Obviously, I'm not one to ask about this. So um, the Associated Press had some footage and interviews, uh, which was pretty insightful. And then uh, Laura K. Buzz also gave some comprehensive feedback on it, calling it, uh, well, they called it a side, like a step sideways, not quite a step forward, as in it's really great for some, but not so good for others. And that Sony seems to have spent a lot of time making sure it's playable out of the box without the separate attachments if somebody would need them. Um, and that kind of impedes on, you know, de depending on, I guess, what you would need it for. For, right that would either make it great or that would make it not so great uh, but that was also a very insightful video so I'll link that in the uh, description uh, but going back to the PS blog Sony did show off and announce uh, a new third-party accessory the Logitech G adaptive gaming kit that includes eight plug-and-play buttons and triggers with a firm gaming mat that lets you uh, lay out the buttons as you would need with velcro ties and then there's also custom stick on button labels as well and that's launching early 2024 for or 79.99 USD and Euro, uh, or 69.99 pounds, or 109.99 Canadian, which that to me sounds expensive, but um, I, I don't really know the space that well. So um, I, it seems like it's very cost prohibitive, obviously, for anybody that, depending on what you need, you would you know, perhaps have to pick up not only an access controller, but uh, you would have your standard dual sense, maybe another access controller, and then all the separate mounts, which uh, somebody may or may not already have. And then the access controller itself can be a bit limited in terms of you know how many things you can plug into it. So it just seems like a, a bit of a process depending on, again, what somebody would need. It, it would be, it sounds cost prohibitive. I, I do hope that they would maybe want to focus on a Gen 2 or Gen 3 device, which it, it does sound like they want to do that. They want to make this very uh, iterative. So, you know, as long as they're in the right place and they're looking to uh, make something that is uh, viable for an audience that needs it, you know, that's that's the good thing. Now, you know, we got to talk about this. 
which is another ongoing development in the physical media landscape where recently it's been not good, obviously. <laughs> so this uh, comes from the Digital Bits where they're citing multiple sources that Best Buy plans on exiting the physical media business as soon as Q1 2024, which would include in-store and online sales of Blu-ray, 4K Ultra HD, and DVD. The article makes no mention of games specifically, but we did also have Josh Fairhurst, the CEO of Limited Run, mention on X that he's apparently heard Walmart is considering a similar move in dropping physical Xbox games soon, which kind of goes back to, um, you know, when we were talking about that, uh, you know, Series X redesign that showed up in Microsoft statements, internal documents from the uh, the whole FTC versus Microsoft thing, and. Uh, the average Xbox customer is primarily digital, right? They're the they have the largest ratio of digital games, so that's not too surprising. That's why you know limited run and limited print companies normally don't ship Xbox uh, physical games. It's almost always PS4 or five or Switch. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's uh, more bad news. We had that one store, that one chain in the UK, uh, recently drop physical games, uh, where they were phasing that business out, and uh, it really comes down to shelf space. Uh, obviously, it's not necessarily good news, but um, you know, even with online sales, I think is the more surprising aspect here that you know Best Buy wouldn't want to carry these things uh, and store them at a fulfillment center and you know fulfill games that way. Which they still, as far as I know, they they do well in the well. I thought they did well with the uh, the games business. I actually pick up games from Best Buy. Uh, fairly often it's a, a really easy experience when you place an online order you go in it's right near the door when you walk in and uh, it's like a no questions asked kind of thing right you just you get your game you leave and because uh, it's not like GameStop or you, you know you're getting a sales pitch left and right and I know they're they're forced to do that but um, Best Buy is a, a very easy experience to go buy and pick up anything so I go there for games a lot uh, and that also means now there's no pre-order bonuses no uh, steel books they do a lot of those um, which both of these things I don't typically do but I know folks do enjoy those things and so yeah that's uh that would be a big bummer if a, a major retailer does drop out like that um there's still going to be online fulfillment but as we like to say here it starts and ends with the platform holders if they're not offering <laughs> disc playback then there's no option whatsoever so for the foreseeable future we do have sony doing it and i think conceivably there's no reason there, there's no reason why ps6 should not have a disc drive we will see. Uh, Xbox does seem to be, you know, accelerating that path uh, fast for their customer where they just typically have that higher ratio. And Nintendo, I think it's a very safe bet that they're not going to be exiting uh, physical media anytime soon. They might offer a digital only, you know, next generation Nintendo hardware uh, as an option, but uh, at least for right now, <laughs> that was the uh, newest not so good development for physical games. Now this story is really cool because I thought this was not possible, but apparently it is, and you don't need any sort of modern dev kit to release official patches because what recently happened was the scene member Illusion, who has been making unofficial PS4 patches uh, to release the frame rate cap on 30 FPS games, and then when you play those games on PS5 through backwards compatibility, then you can get some PS4 titles that were locked at 30 to now run at 60 but they've now released patches for 120 frames per second, which a lot of these titles apparently don't hit 120 locked, uh, but I would imagine that means they're floating around 80 to 90 uh, on average. Maybe they're you know a little bit higher in the hundreds, but uh, for the most part, we do see that uh, they recently released a number of patches for some uh, fairly well-known high-profile PS4 games. And uh, again, these are for, well, you would need an exploitable PS5 on firmware. Uh, between firmware is 3.0, and 4.51 that's how this would be possible in theory which means you would have to stay offline you can't um, turn your console on and download official firmware but if you like being in that scene it's really cool that this is possible because I thought that was a um I thought that was a, a modern dev kit feature, uh, like how it can be problematic for working on really old PS4 titles that were not made on a PlayStation 4 Pro dev kit, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, very cool to see, and uh, hopefully we uh, see more titles out of Illusion get this kind of treatment. Moving on to what might just be our final update for the Microsoft acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Because earlier in the week, it was rumored that today was going to be the day that they would close on the deal. They were getting very close to the deadline. And as of right now, 
as I'm speaking, <laughs> the uh, Activision stock has halted, can't trade, and uh, also the CMA has provided approval for the transaction, which means they have got the go-ahead, they have every major approval, and uh, they will probably close in the early morning uh, or possibly in the evening. I have no idea when it will be official per se, uh, but as of right now, they have the go-ahead, which means that is the sort of initial conclusion to the entire ordeal which took over a year long and a lot of um you know legal proceedings and we got some crazy news stories out of it from all those documents that came out a lot of ones that leaked and the ones that were published um the marker thing with sony lawyers and then microsoft with the ftc and just a lot of insane stuff it's um been something where the whole process has been insightful to cover right and it's certainly something where when i say initial closure i very much mean that because you know based on the results of this i mean this is not over now we have to see how microsoft is going to manage what was previously a massive triple a third party publisher so there are many titles now that in theory sony is not guaranteed anymore because they only signed a 10-year agreement for the call of duty franchise uh that was the most important one to get for sony obviously but this is the end of part one basically there's so much more now that may or may not happen and what i mean is that maybe sony will work out an agreement for more ip Maybe they won't. Maybe maybe Microsoft will start to withhold other properties. The one thing I always go back to and think of is the email exchange we got from this entire process. It was a, an email from 2021 between Phil Spencer and I think Matt Booty, or it might have been Tim Stewart. But um, you know they were discussing uh, post Bethesda acquisition about Fallout 76 on PS Now, and at the time Phil. Uh, was okay with it for that particular game because of the circumstance it was in. They wanted more players on it and this and that. So he said, yeah, it's fine. I feel like it's different from Minecraft or, or whatever. And um, But uh, they were talking about that whole situation. And Phil mentioned that, but going forward, he wants their portfolio to be all you know all one thing right when it comes to other partners whether it is sony or uh, another publisher for their own service you know they don't want their games to be picked apart like that they would rather the entire catalog be on offer and some sort of deal is is made for that right so assuming their principles have not changed from back then that would probably paint us a good idea of what to expect with how they'll handle activision blizzard properties post acquisition is that they would want to bargain the entire catalog and Sony would not be able to say, can we get Crash and you know maybe Spyro and can we get the next Tony Hawk? It would be, no, no, you have to sign some kind of agreement uh, for all these games. And we know that Microsoft, again, from all these emails, um, their sort of bargaining chips and what they would want out of this is Game Pass on PlayStation. So uh, yeah, it's uh, this is not the end, but we will talk about this again when we have anything that comes up uh, relating to it. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway, where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. And for right now, we still have to stay on pause. I'm waiting to hear back from somebody about how I may or may not be able to approach using the links, because again, they just keep getting hit and uh, stuff is showing up in the YouTube dashboard, reminding me about YouTube policies for uh, deceptive links in the description. So clearly we have to tread lightly on this. Uh, so for now, no update to give, but I'll let you know as soon as I have one. Those are all the news stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all. And our Tuesday video was two things covering the initial PS5 new model announcement. So uh, just covering the news there and, and all that good stuff. Uh, but our standard Tuesday upload was trying out a PS3 feature that I'm sure, I, I'm confident in saying this, 99% of PS3 owners have never actually done this, but I made it happen, documented on video, which I assure you, it's not that interesting, but Terrell is the cameraman in that video, so that alone should be worth watching. So you can go check that out as well. But uh, that is pretty much it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Bonacki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.